Take our Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Kings, chapter number 3. The Old Testament book of 2 Kings in chapter number 3 this evening, and we find God's message there. I come to a very unusual story in the Word of God, and I've taken an unusual title that matches this particular story. I want to preach to you tonight on the subject of digging ditches in the valley. Digging ditches in the valley. I want to ask this. How many of you have ever physically digged a ditch? How many fall in that category? You know, a lot of ladies just raise their hand. Isn't that interesting? And uh, some of these older ladies just raise their hands. These are tough, tough girls, right? And uh, they may have digged a deeper ditch than some of us men, right? And I want us to come to 2 Kings chapter number 3. And I really hope to be an encouragement and a blessing in the minutes that we have together tonight. Look at the fourth verse, if you would please, and follow along as we begin to read the story, the account that's given here in the Word of God. The Bible says in verse 4, And Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs, and an hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. As we pause there for just a moment in our reading, we'll look at this account together tonight. But I want you to know the setting that we find ourselves in here in 2 Kings chapter number 3. This is the setting of the ministry of Elisha. And many of you would know that Elisha was a prophet of God, a mighty prophet of God who succeeded Elijah. And these were two men who had a lot in common because they both were uh, mouthpieces for God and they both performed many miracles under the power of God. But yet there were two men who were totally different in a sense. Elijah was a man who was more the prophet of fire. And Elisha, the man that, in whose ministry we find ourselves here, is more the prophet of love and a prophet of mercy and a prophet of grace. But both of them mighty men of God. And we find here our, ourselves in the time period of Elisha. We find ourselves in the time period where Israel is divided into two kingdoms. And that's spoken of here. There is the northern kingdom called Israel, and the king at this time is a man named Jehoram, whose name is mentioned, and he happens to be the son of Ahab. And many people remember Ahab and Jezebel as they were a wicked king and queen, a very wicked king and queen in the northern kingdom. And this is Ahab's son, Jehoram, who now has the northern kingdom. And then also is mentioned Jehoshaphat, and he's a king in the southern kingdom. And at the same time, both men are kings, and Jehoshaphat is known as one of the good kings of Israel. Very few of those, just a handful of them, but he's known as one of the good guys. And he tried to follow after the Lord and tried to follow after the word of God and made a few mistakes along the way and uh, perhaps didn't make all the best choices even in this story for sure, but he was trying to do right, and he's numbered among one of the good kings. And then the, the last character that we find here is uh, really, a couple of characters sort of side by side. Edom is mentioned, and that is a foe of Israel by nature, but they're going to become a friend here in battle. These three kings, Israel and Judah and Edom, are going to form a, an alliance together and fight against another foe named Moab. And the country of Moab was always a nemesis to Israel. And in the setting that we find here that we just read, Moab has previously been subject to Israel, and now she's rebelled. She used to send her tribute and send the lambs and the rams and all that and submit to Israel's power, but now she's rebelled. She's thrown off that yoke. And the idea is that Moab is getting stronger and she may attack Israel. She may even attack Judah. She may even attack Edom. And so these men are going to get their heads together and they're going to try to form an alliance to take on Moab. And it just all sets the stage for God to do something amazing. And you might be thinking, well, what in the world do I have to do with three ancient kings and 
uh, an ancient enemy that they face. But I think if you let God speak to you, you'll find some great application to your life. Let's continue on. And I want you to notice, first of all, in the account, as we come to verse 9, I want you to notice, first of all, the plight of these kings. What happened? What was their situation? Uh, where did, in what situation did they find themselves? I want you to notice how things turned bad pretty quickly. In verse number 9, it says, So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. And they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel, that's Jehoram, said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Let's pause there in our reading for just a moment. These three kings may have been leaders and they may have been leading nations, but I want you to note they weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, okay? I don't know what they were thinking. In fact, occasionally I look at leaders of nations today and I think, how did that happen, you know? Well, you apply that however you want to worldwide, right? <laughs> These weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer because they get their, they get their heads together and say, yeah, let's go take on the enemy. And they, they form an alliance, they get... Uh, a bond here, even though they're really not friends, they make a bond out of a common enemy, Moab, and they say, let's go after them. They get all the armies together and all the cattle and the provisions are being dragged along with wagons and everything's coming with this huge host of army. And by the time they set out and they realize something, hold on, we're out here and we've got another seven days journey. And as we get in the middle of this journey, we're in the middle of a desert and we don't have anything to drink. Now, of all the things to forget, how could you forget that, right? We've got to have water. And these men are, are acting uh, in a way that seems to be noble, seem to be doing a good thing, but I want you to notice their plight here. First of all, look at the dilemma that they faced. Really, this was a dilemma of their own making. You ever had that in your life? You ever found yourself out on a limb and you realized, I'm the one who crawled out here? And I'm the one who's got a saw and I'm sort of sawing it off behind me. I, this is really my fault. Now, of course, Jeroboam, Jer, uh, excuse me, Jehoram said in verse 10, Alas, the Lord hath called these kings together to deliver them. You know, it's easy to blame on God what's really our fault, isn't it? And he is not really the spiritual one in the group. And he says, you know what? Je this is Jehovah's fault. He, he brought us together and he let us out. And now we don't know what we're going to do. You see, these guys are in a major dilemma and they really can't blame God for it. It's their fault. And as they look at the situation that they're in, really, it looks like they're definitely going to fail. I mean, they found themselves in the middle of a dilemma where failure looks certain. They've taken on more, it seems like, than they can ever handle. They bit off more than they can chew, as we say sometimes. And they're out there and they got all this army and all these men out there and all the cattle out there with them and they can't turn back and they can't move forward. They're stuck and they don't know what to do. You know, Spurgeon said, God has a way of bringing into checkmate a man. He brings a man into checkmate despite all of his wisdom and all of his strength. God knows how to bring a man into a checkmate. How many chess players are out there? You know what I'm talking about? You can't move. If you're a NASCAR fan, God knows how to pin you to the wall, okay? Uh, if you're a housewife, I'm not sure what to say. God knows how to empty your fridge, okay? I don't know what to cook tonight, you know? God knows what he's doing. And God brought these guys, as, as smart as they thought they were, and as aggressive as they thought they were, in fact, it's a noble cause. They're trying to preserve their own people. But God had a way of bringing their wisdom to an end and saying, checkmate, you don't know what to do, do you? You can't turn back. You can't go forward. You're going to fail, aren't you? And you know what? We find ourselves many times in the same kind of dilemma. Lord, I've tried, and I'm trying to do something right, and I'm sincere in this, and trying to raise children, but, Lord, I feel like I'm going to fail. <laughs> trying to serve God in a church, but, Lord, I don't see the fruit. I feel like I'm failing. Trying to establish a, a work in a ministry or whatever it may be, and we say, I'm doing all I can, and I've put all my mind together and all my heart together, but I kind of look stupid now. Doesn't look like this is going to work, does it? I'm stuck. I can't turn back. I, I, I'm too proud to do that. I can't go forward because I don't even know how to win the victory. You know, God has a way of, of, 
allowing us to do the best we can and saying, checkmate, you don't know where to go, do you? And these men were brought into a checkmate. Not only the dilemma that they faced, but look at verse 11. Notice the decision that they made. In verse 11, Jehoshaphat, remember he's the more spiritual. I didn't say he's smarter than these other guys. I question his, uh, you know, his uh, discernment a little bit for sure. But he's a little bit of the spiritual guy in the bunch. And it says, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord of him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. You know, at first glance, they didn't know what to do. But I've got news for you. They made the right decision. Jehoshaphat said, you know what? We are powerless, but we are not prayerless. We don't have any strength. We don't have any ability. We're at our end, but we can get a hold of God. I'm going to stop here tonight and tell you, I'm glad that when we don't know what to do, we still don't have to be prayerless. We still have a way that's been made like the choir was singing through the blood and past the veil into the holy of holies with God. And by the way, the Bible says that when we come that we find grace to help in time of need. They're powerless, but they're not prayerless. And Jehoshaphat says, let's get to the man of God. Let's find somebody who can tell us what God needs to tell us because if we can find out what God wants us to do, then, then we'll know what to do. You know, it's, it's humbling, it's sad, but it's, but it's really a humbling thing when God checkmates us and we realize, you know what, this really was the best thing for me because it's causing me to run back to the Lord. I, I'm a parent and I don't know what I'm doing and I feel like I'm failing, but it's caused me to get on my knees and pray and seek God and find out what to do. I, I, I'm in a ministry and trying to serve God and it doesn't seem like it's working out. It doesn't seem like the results are coming, but it causes me to say, you know what? I've got to get back through the veil uh, to the holy of holies with God and I've got to find out what God wants me to do. We may be in a relationship with somebody else it's not working out. We're trying to mend it. We're trying to fix it. We're trying to make it right. We can't do it. And you know, the good thing about that checkmate is it causes us to realize, you know what? I've got to get to God again. And Jehoshaphat finally does the smartest thing he's done in the chapter. He says, let's go find out what God says through Elisha. Let's find a man of God. So the plight of the kings. And then notice secondly, as you come to verse number 13, the promise of the prophet. What's he going to say? Look at verse number 13. It says, and Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. Remember, his mother and father were Ahab and Jezebel and they worshiped Baal. Remember the prophets of Baal that show, had a showdown with Elijah. He said, why don't you go to those prophets? And the king of Israel said unto him, verse 13, nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Uh, can I pause here and say this? Elisha is a little unnerved here, okay? He knows this is a God denier. He knows this Jehoram is not a, a servant of the true and living God. And he says, go to your gods. But Jehoshaphat's here, so I'm going to listen. I, I, I'm going to get in on this thing. I'm going to try to get the word of God on this. Look at verse 15. 15, he says, but now bring me a minstrel. That's someone who played the harp. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Can I pause here and say this? Here, here's a man of God, Elisha, and he knew that his spirit needed to be calmed down a little bit. You ever been there? He knew that he was agitated and he was upset at the presence of these men like Jehoram and he knew, I need to get my heart right. I need to get my heart soft so I can know what God wants me to say here. And so he brought in a man who could play beautifully on the harp. And no doubt he was playing the songs of Zion, right? He was playing those psalms that we have right here in the word of God and causing Elijah to get his spirit and his heart in tune with God. And, and Elisha did not work up getting an answer from God, but I think he put himself in a place where God could speak to him. 
It's a great lesson for that for our lives. And he got his heart in tune with God. And guess what? God gave him a promise. Look at the promise here of the prophet. He says in verse 16, And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall, not, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. I want you to notice, first of all, the extent of the promise. How far did this promise go? You see, he told them, uh, he said, if you'll do this, if you'll make the valley full of ditches, notice he says here, he says, the valley shall be filled with the water. Can I say this to you this evening? God's promises always exceed our problems. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care how great the need is. I don't care how, how magnificent it may seem or how, how, how much you may feel like you're in a fix and you don't know where to go or what to do. I got news for you. The promises of God always exceed your problems. Amen. Add them all up and God's promise is greater. And Elisha comes in tune with God and he comes out there and he says, I want you to know this, God is gonna fill up that valley. And you know what? These men weren't even asking for victory. They were just coming because they thought, we just don't want to be destroyed. Moab's going to find us in weakness without water and without strength and without uh, the provision that we need. And Moab's going to see that. They're going to come over. They're going to destroy us. They were just asking for some kind of deliverance. And God said, I'm going to do more than that. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to fill up this valley with a bunch of water and you're going to find strength and your cattle are going to find strength and all the beasts with you are going to find strength and you're going to rise up and guess what? Not only that, but I'm going to go ahead and give Moab into your hand. You see, God's promise extended way, way beyond what they were even thinking or what they were even asking for. Can I tell you this? That's just like the Lord, isn't it? That's what God always does. Then notice the condition of this promise. You see, there's something that we find repeatedly in the Word of God, and that is that God's promises are often connected to a command. In other words, there's man's part and then there's God's part. And God connects this promise to a command here. He says, there's something for you to do and then there's a promise for me to fulfill. If you'll do your part, then I will certainly come and I will do my part. And I think that's really the heart of the story. It's really the heart of the account here. It's the heart of the lesson that God has for us because the first thing he said was, Make this valley full of ditches. You know, that was not anything miraculous. That was not anything at all that seemed to be, you know, famous, seemed to be glorious. No, 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 no. God doesn't come on and say, I want you to do the, the miraculous. God says, I'm the one who does the miraculous. But you need to come on board and you need to do what I've given you to do. There's man's part and there's God's part. What were they supposed to do? Well, they were stuck in a valley. It was a desert valley between the land of Israel and Judah and Moab over there to the east of Israel and Judah. And if you look on your, in your Bible maps, you're going to see that is an arid desert region. And there's no water there. So they're in the middle of nowhere and there's no water. And you're talking about hard ground, dry ground, and God says, all right, I have a work for you to do. You know, it's a humble work. I asked how many have ever been digging ditches before. Uh, I don't think anybody ever got a badge for digging a ditch. I don't think anybody ever got certified in digging a ditch. I don't think anybody ever got employee of the month for digging a ditch, okay? It's a humble work. These men have their swords. These men have their spears. These men have their shields. And God says, set all that down. No swords right now. No spears right now. No shields right now. You need a pick and you need some shovels. You need some laboring instruments. And God says, get out there and make this whole valley full of ditches. Can you imagine that army going into action? 
I would imagine, just if I know men like I am one, there was some grumbling that was going on, don't you think? We didn't come out here to dig ditches. How in the world could Jehoram and Jehoshaphat and whoever the king of Edom is, his name isn't given, how in the world could these guys be our leaders and lead us out here without any water? Can you imagine these men riling up, bristling up maybe? But they came out and they said, this is what God has for us to do. God's going to do something, but we got to do our part. It's a humble work. And I got news for you. That was a hard work. Now, they'd rather be storming a city and having a victory. Man, that's glorious. But no, this is just hard labor, dry ground that hasn't rained in who knows how long. And there's no water there. And I mean, I, I know it's tough to dig a ditch in any kind of ground, but I know it's tough when it's hard ground, right? And these guys are out there with their picks and their shovels and whatever other instruments they could get, and they're just digging the ditches. And God said, make it full of ditches. Make all the preparation. Make it full. So there was a condition for God coming in and doing what he said he would do. They had to do the work. And I'm thinking in my mind, God has given us things that, he, that we know we're supposed to be doing. You know, God has told us in our ministry and in our, in our lives as we try to work for the Lord in our homes and in our church and with other people, God said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be giving the gospel. You're supposed to be continuing in the word of God. You're supposed to be living in obedience. You're supposed to be living in prayer and bring your needs to me. And all, we could go all the way down the line. That's what our pastor's training us and teaching us in day after day and week after week is he labors in the word of God. We're finding out so much, so plainly what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes we sit around and say, you know, I'm waiting for the glorious thing to do. I'm waiting for that big fancy thing to do. I'm waiting, for, I'm waiting to storm a city and take out a sword and take something for God and get some accolades. And you know, God says, take out your shovel, take out your pick and just do what you know to do. Do your part and I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna do the miraculous part. Then I notice also here in this promise, there's a principle within the promise. It's really a twofold principle. I, I just noted this, number one, the first part of the principle is, is that our work is a work of faith. You know, God's designed it so that there's a fusion between his miraculous work, his divine work, and our, our, our work that we do with our hands. He's so designed it that he can work in concert with our work. Isn't that amazing? And this work is a work of faith. God said here in verse number 17 through Elisha, he said, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Now, if they were out there in the middle of this valley, thousands of men and they're digging ditches and the wind starts blowing and the clouds start swirling and getting darker, I would think if I were out there, I'd start digging even deeper, wouldn't you? I said, wow, it's coming. God's going to show up. Woo, it's going to be good. Let's get out. I'd be digging as hard as I could dig, just waiting for it to start pouring. But God said, you're not going to feel any wind. It's going to be hot out there. There's not going to be any sign at all that I'm going to show up and do something. But you just have to keep digging, and you just have to keep swinging that pick and sticking that shovel in the ground. You keep doing what I told you to do, and you just do it as a work of faith, believing that when, I, when my timing's right and when I know it's time, I'm going to show up and I'm going to fill up those ditches. God said, you just dig. Do it in faith. There's no wind or rain to inspire you, but just keep digging. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to spend your energy on this, but just keep digging. Do it in faith. And I'm going to tell you this, friend the greatest demonstration that we really have faith in God is when we just get up in the morning and we say, dear Lord, I'm just going to live in obedience to you today. I'm going to be the Christian that you want me to be today. I'm going to be the father you want me to be today. I'm going to be the husband you want me to be today. I'm going to be the witness you want me to be today. I'm going to be the church member that you want me to be today. And when we live in obedience and we, we sort of plow our row and dig our trench... Listen, we may not feel the wind and we may not see the rain and we, God may not be giving signs that he's gonna bless that, but I got news for you, he will. Amen. We do our part, he will do his part. The work we do is a work of faith. And the second part of this, I noticed this, the principle is twofold. It's a work of faith, but it's a work of preparation. I wanna tell you, all of our work that we're doing right now in this life, 
All of it is a preparatory work. It is a preliminary work. In fact, that seems to be emphasized uniquely in the ministry of Elisha. We're in chapter number three. Back in chapter number two, Elisha takes the mantle of Elijah. You know what he did? He went out to the Jordan River and with all the sons of the prophets watching, he took the mantle off and he smacked the water and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now I'm gonna tell you, that took faith. What if nothing happens? No, no, no. It was a work of faith. And he said, I'm going to do something and call on God to show up. And he did. That happened in chapter 2. The next chapter after this, guess what he told the little widow woman whose two sons were about to be taken away? He said, I'll tell you what to do. Go to all your neighbors and get all the vessels you can. Get them all in the house. Well, what do you have? I just have a little cruise of oil. He said, well, get all the vessels together. And when she did, she started pouring that oil. And guess what? She filled up as many vessels as she had prepared. See, God keeps showing us through Elijah, uh, Elisha that we step out, we do the work in preparation, and then God shows up. In fact, in the very next chapter, chapter 5, Naaman comes to him. He's got leprosy. And God says, here's, or Elisha says, here's what you do. Go down the river, dunk seven times, and then God will touch you and God will heal you. He had to make the preparation. And then God showed up and did the miracle. And all throughout the ministry of Elisha, this is what we're finding. It's a principle that our work is preliminary to God's work. And see, we're too proud for that. We want our work to be the final work. We want to build our ministries or build our works or, 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 or raise our families or do our job for the Lord. And we want to do that and think, hey, I've done something. This is the final work. No, And God says, no, that's not how I do it. You don't get the glory in this thing. Your work is the preparatory work. It's a work of faith and it's a work of preparation. Your work is the work that is preliminary and my work is the work that is final. You know, if we really expect God to do something, true expectation is always going to be preceded by preparation, isn't it? Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you think, you know, I really need God to come through. I need, I, need, I need a blessing. I, I've been struggling. I've been in despair. And I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I, I, it looks like I'm going to fail. It looks like I'm not going to. I don't know how to go forward. I don't know how to turn around. I'm checkmated. I don't know what to do. I throw my hands up, Lord. I don't, I don't know why I haven't succeeded. I don't know why everything keeps blowing up in my face. In fact, probably it's me. It looks like it was my own doing, Lord. And God says, you know what? If you'll just prepare, if you'll just dig the ditches, I'll show up and I'll do what only I can do when it's time for me to do it. Can I ask you this question? Have you made your heart full of ditches? Have you made your home full of ditches? Have you made your ministry full of ditches in, in this church? Have you, have you dug ditches all throughout your neighborhood? Have you dug ditches in the relationship you have with other people trying to see them come to the Lord? I'm just trying to tell you, if you haven't made the preparation, then you don't have any expectation. If I haven't made the preparation, then I don't have the faithful expectation that I ought to have for God to do His work. When is it time to dig the ditches? Well, when I look in the story here, I find out they did it right away. I want you to notice lastly, not only the plight of these kings and the promise of the prophet, but I want you to notice, if you would, thirdly, the power of the Lord. You know what it says in verse 18? Elisha said, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. You know, God's power is beyond what we can ever imagine, isn't it? And the thing that's so heavy to us is no weight at all to God. The thing that is just overcoming us I mean, we're just in despair. We don't know where to go, where to turn. I got news for you. It's nothing at all to God. I see, first of all, in here, the measure of his blessing. The measure of his blessing. It says in verse number 20, And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. Look at the measure of God's blessing. Somebody says, What does it mean, Brother Tim, that the water came by way of Edom? 
I want you to know there is no Bible expositor and no Bible scholar and no Bible commentary that's going to be able to tell you what that means. You know why? Because there's no natural explanation for it. It didn't come through rain and God doesn't tell us exactly how it came. He says it came by way of Eden. We know that was unlikely. That was a whole desert area. We don't know how it came, but all we know is it came, friend. In the morning, it came. In the morning, it came. They did what they were supposed to do today, and in the morning, when the sun rose, God showed up. And when God showed up, the measure was beyond what they ever imagined. In fact, it did two things. The measure won the victory for them. Uh, it was their means of victory over Moab, but it was also the sustenance that they needed personally. And my, that's what God does. He sends the blessing and it ministers to our own heart. It ministers to our own soul, but it also comes in a perfect timing to give the victory that we need. Look at verse number 21. It says, and when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. The earth was red in that part of the country. And they said, this is blood and the kings are surely slain and they have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. And so they go recklessly out into the valley thinking, well, they have all killed themselves. We're just gonna take up the spoil. It says in verse 24, when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forth smiting the Moabites even into their country. I want you to know the measure of God's blessing was more than enough. It came in perfect timing. It was all that they ever needed. And I'm just trying to tell you an application tonight. God can come through for you. You dig your ditches. You do your part. You live by faith. You make all the preparation in your home and in your family and in your heart and in your ministry and in your work that you're doing. Dig the ditches in the valley. Make the preparation. Do your part. And I got news for you. It's not a matter of will God come through. It's a matter of saying God will come through. Amen. You know, there's nobody in this room, nobody, in this room who is insulated from getting despondent. There's nobody in here who has some insulation from becoming in despair or becoming despondent, thinking, you know, I put forth all this effort. I've tried and I've gathered all this strength together and it's just all come to a checkmate. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. There's nobody in this room insulated from that. But I got news for you. If we'll, if we'll plant the seed, if we'll, if we'll till the ground, God is the one who can give the increase. If we'll do our part, if we'll dig our ditches, God is the one who can miraculously fill it with water. God is the one who can give the victory. And I long to see God come through, don't you? Amen. Has he come through in the past? Has he ever let us down? Has he ever failed us? Has there ever failed to be a morning when we woke up and God had shown up? No. I'm just trying to encourage your heart tonight. I'm going to tell you if you, found your, if you find yourself sort of one of these times where you just feel like you're failing, I want to encourage you. Pick up your shovel. Just dig your ditch. Let God come through. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truths that we can draw from it tonight. Simple message, uh, not difficult to understand, but one that I think we need to hear tonight, and I believe you've led us to for this night. And Lord, there may be some of your people among us tonight who have, they're really feeling the load, Lord. They're feeling the discouragement. They're feeling the failure coming on. And I pray you would encourage their heart tonight. I pray their heart would literally just feel lifted by the Holy Ghost of God to keep on digging their ditch. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on being obedient to the Lord. To be more fervent in prayer. To 
be more dedicated to the Lord, and then to live a life of faith, just preparing always for you to show up and for you to do the work that you want to do. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you that we know all this is true because of what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're praying this in Christ's name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, the pastor will come and extend the invitation tonight.